Welcome to the latest edition of the Mind Gut Conversation podcast, a place to learn about breakthroughs in the science and practice of health, mind body interactions, the microbiome, food, and the environment. Today, I have the great pleasure to talk to Dr. Aviva Ram, author of seven books, including the New York Times bestseller, Hormone Intelligence. Aviva has one of the most remarkable career paths and skill sets that I've ever encountered, the details of which we will explore in this interview. In brief, Aviva went to college at age 15 in the pre-med track, only to leave a year later to become a midwife and herbalist. 25 years later, and many experiences richer, and having raised four children, she went back to school and got her MD at the prestigious Yale School of Medicine. In her own words, I became who I am now, a midwife, herbalist, ecologist, mom, writer, and Yale-trained MD. Welcome to the show, Aviva. Aviva, it's a great pleasure to have the opportunity to talk to you on this podcast. Um, been tremendously impressed by your writings and uh, all the information and activities you promote on your on your website i mean quite honestly i've not seen anything sort of similar to this in this field even though I've talked to a lot of people now and wow thank you i would like to start with uh, you have a very unusual career path um and, and and i think that explains a lot who you are and what you promote mm. so <laughs> maybe starting with that you know if you could just uh, in a few words say how you got into what you're doing now. Yeah. So the long story short is that I was a science geek from the time I was a tiny girl. And I also loved to write. So both of those things. And I went to college when I was 15. And within a couple of months, somebody gave me an article that was written in the 1970s by the Czechoslovakian psychiatrist Stanislav Grof, mm -hmm. who initially was known for his LSD psychotherapy work, very prescient, mm -hmm. and uh, ultimately moved into doing a lot of work with trauma and breath work. And this particular paper by Stanislav Grof talked about uh, it was what he called the perinatal roots of war. And his thesis, which I think was a little bit overly simplified in some ways, but nonetheless really important, and I think something we're going to continue to hear more about and that's dear to me, which is that perinatal, so prenatal and intrapartum, so during birth and postpartum experiences for the mother and for the baby can set in motion what we now know are trauma and stress and neurobiological responses that can lead to a lifetime of internalized trauma and a lifetime of behaviors that we don't know where they come from that cause us to, in one way or another, either recreate or self-medicate for those initial traumas. Mm -hmm. That work for me as an impressionable 15-year-old who was already getting a little bit interested in things like psychedelics and politics and women's health was like a million light bulbs going off. And simultaneously, I had received a copy of a book called Spiritual Midwifery, which was a very early, very hippie book about home birth. And I had started to read about food and ecological uh, environmental politics and all these things together, Emran, just what, there was no avenue in 1981 when all of this was kind of an awakening for me was happening. So I left school at 16, left college, had left high school at ninth, at in ninth grade, left college at 16 and moved to Boston. I was living in Massachusetts and apprenticed myself to midwives Amazing. and uh, studied with herbalists that I could find because this was way before there was anything called integrative medicine or even alternative medicine. This was just out of the box fringe stuff. In fact, I went back and I was looking through some 
talks that I had given back in the early 90s. You remember overhead projectors mm -hmm. and the things that we, and I found a talk recently that I had written in the early 1990s connecting vaginal health for women and the microbiome. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I was like, oh my gosh. Then I was connecting soil and all, you know, food. So it was just this kind of out of the box journey. And then uh, four children, you know, long marriage, four children, all the hippie, herbal, natural, midwifery stuff. In my, you know, experience, I was like, I need to go back on my original path. It's not that this was off my original path, but it came full circle because when I went to college at 15, I wanted to be a doctor, but I couldn't find what I was looking for mm -hmm. in that world. So I had to go out of that world. But then I realized I needed to come back into it and really try to be a voice in that world for change. But also the whole wellness movement started happening during that time. And I also felt like I needed to be a voice that allowed people to find someone they could trust to help sort of sometimes separate fad from fact also. So I went back to school, got my MD at Yale. And that was 17 years ago that I went to, you know, back and now have been practicing as a physician for since what, 2009. So almost, thir is that 13 years? Yeah. Phenomenal story. So, I mean, you could also say, you know, you were a dropout in high school and in college, you became a hippie, lived a hippie lifestyle, <laughs> and then went back to one of the, you know, cathedrals of, of yeah. traditional medicine and, um, and have been able to integrate all these influences into what you do. Yes. Sometimes I think about it as the hero's journey. You know, Joseph Campbell wrote about yeah. the hero's journey. And how, or you think about somebody like um, Demeter, right? The Greek goddess Demeter, because so much of what we now have departments at universities like yours studying was literally just underground. I mean, literally underground in that it was the soil and the food and, but also it was very countercultural. Mm -hmm. So there wasn't any way for someone like me to learn that in the conventional model. And in fact, most of the conventional model was really dismissive of these types of things. So I sometimes think of it's like the hero's journey. I was on this path and then I had to go to the underground to <laughs> find this information and then come back up with the information. And now go on the quest to the palette, you know, so what you all, what you say, that's how I think of it as this quest I've been on, but really it's been one continuous thread, just finding the ways to gather the information where I could gather it. Yeah, really fascinating. Uh, I mean, you know, in some ways um, <clears throat> I found it fascinating that many of these ideas that, because you, you mentioned the word hippie, many of the ideas that came up in the 60s, I mean, that includes women's health and I mean, everything that you mentioned, soil health, ecology, um, plant-based nutrition, I mean, you can pretty much list all the things that have now come out as, as sort of the the the, the cutting edge of, <clears throat> of 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 wellness and integrative medicine. Yes, that, <clears throat> including that, this new wave of psychedelics. Exactly, exactly, and yeah. So when I was, um, you know, when uh, when I came to UCLA and first did, did the research program and then became a fellow there and training in gastroenterology, so I I spent all my weekends driving up to Esalen. Yep. <laughs> uh, and 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 heard many of these things, including Stanislav Grof and uh, Campbell. And so I, I have a pretty deep connection to that as well, because it's uh, um, but again, I mean, I was probably the only GI fellow who ever uh, was interested in these kind of topics, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, the psychedelics, fascinating topic, how that is, is sort of come back um from a very rich uh, environment of research and, and excitement to, you know, gone into suppressed obscurity and then now returning in sort of an, an yes. amazing way. And, um, well, and so many of the people who even, you know, I think back to someone like Semmelweis, who for those who are listening and watching don't know, was a physician in Europe who what ended up uh, dying imprisoned or in an asylum 
uh, who really was a, a, an outspoken proponent of early hand washing and, and the idea that physicians were actually spreading childbirth fever from one cadaver or one woman to another, whether they were in the morgue or in the obstetric unit. And um, so, someone like Groff or so many of these early thinkers were either ostracized or had to let go of what they did and repackage it in more um, uh, sort of conventionally acceptable ways. And I, I think right now, as much as the world is in so much distress from a scientific perspective and a medical perspective, this is some of the most exciting times that I've ever seen. Because when I think about things like climate change, for example, and I can remember saying to my husband 30 years ago, there's so much that we argue about in politics, but at the end of the day, if we can't breathe the air, we can't drink the water and we can't grow things in the soil, we're all connected by those things. And when I think about human health and climate change and soil and microbiome, some of these things that were so fringe are now truly, I think, the things that are going to actually be the only way that we can solve some of these bigger problems that we're facing in the world. Yeah, we're not quite there yet. I mean, they still have forty percent of the people not believing in it, you know. So I true. Think, but but I mean, the more severe it gets, obviously, you know, the the more uh, consensus is going to build around it. I'm, yeah. I'm sure. It's, um, um, so, yeah one one important part of um, you, you uh, is illustrated by your journey is is the special role of of women, and it's not coincidence that you picked an area of you know, of women's health and to give so many examples of how that has been maltreated really by the, mm -hmm. the traditional medical system and yeah. from sort of industry. Um, so we have had sort of experience with that because um, when the third uh, funding cycle of, um, of a score grant from the Office of Women's Health Research at the NIH, so I've, I've been exposed to that a lot and yeah. realized something that I didn't know before from medical school that so many of the studies of medications, uh, you know, were only done on 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 male animals and on male patients, and then it was assumed, you know, women would, if women had side effects, and it was just like something neurotic, uh, right. you know, not a not a real thing. And um, I've also experienced in my own. Um, I mean, I wish I had had the opportunity to record this at the time, at a, a big national meeting about irritable bowel syndrome. Um, were some still some of the most revered, uh, you know, leaders in this in this field, got up and said, um, "Well, it doesn't really exist. It's a it's a problem of neurotic housewives." You know, yeah. I couldn't believe this. I mean, like this is like 25, 30 years ago. And yeah, uh, I just was writing. I'm working on an article and a next podcast on medical gaslighting and women, and I've talked about this before on my website and podcast and in my hormone intelligence book where um, we have a number of examples. So like until the 1990s, into the 1990s, migraines in women were described as women having a migraine personality. Mm -hmm. And some of that personality included things like not wanting to be a housewife mm -hmm. or not wanting to have sex with your husband when he wanted to. Mm -hmm. Endometriosis was considered until the 80s and 90s it was called like had almost a, a euphemism, but a way it was described as the career woman's mm -hmm. disease. And again, similarly for women not wanting to fulfill their women, womanly responsibilities. And yes, I mean, to all the things that you're saying about pharmaceuticals, I mean, we know that as women, we have different metabolism and, you know, I like to say women are not small men. And so, yes, we were, we're, you know, we come into the doctor, we say we're having a side effect and the doctor says, well, that couldn't be possible. But in fact, we could be getting a more, um, a, a higher dose in our bloodstream because we're not metabolizing it as quickly or eliminating it as quickly. Yeah. Another thing that, you know, from my own practice, so, you know, I've seen, uh, as, as, as we know, patients with functional, so-called functional, so nowadays we call it brain gut disorders, but yeah. Um, functional disorders, GI disorders like IBS. Um, yeah. It it became pretty clear to me, I mean, seeing, I, I would say thousands of, of, of women with these symptoms that the, the perceptual sensitivity to 
invite to both external and internal stimuli. So what, what do you call the internal and external ecosystems? You know, the signals mm -hmm. that arise from these, that women were more sensitive to these to these stimuli. I mean, not everybody, but um, and that, that that predisposes you know women to have symptoms that male physicians would would blame on neuroticism, you know, or I'm so curious about this. So I think about this a lot and I don't know that the work has been done on it, but we know, for example, that women have typically higher rates of oxytocin production. We have more oxytocin receptors. And part of that is to make us more aware of, for example, facial expressions, we read other people. Mm. And part of that is biologically entrained to make us highly perceptive to the needs of babies and children, should we have them. I And many of the women who come to me in my medical practice are people who I would describe as having a higher awareness. So I'm sure you're familiar with people listening may not be familiar with that term interoception, mm -hmm. but that awareness of our internal organ mm -hmm. sensation. I find a lot of my patients are very aware of external influences and sensations, and many of them are very heightened awareness of sensations internally. And sometimes I wonder, you know, what is the oxytocin gut? interoception vagus nerve like there must be something going on there maybe well, you have some in insights on that well they're almost all you know connected but since we've done a lot of brain imaging studies you know we've found um that many of the differences i mean for example when we compared in, in large numbers you know so the early phase of that research was you looked at 20 patients and 20 uh, healthy controls and you saw all kinds of things you know i mean as you can in retrospect, you can forget about this entire literature, I would say. So today, where we look at hundreds of, of subjects and they're much more carefully selected, and um, it's 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 sort of interesting that the difference, for example, between males and females is larger at the brain level than it is between an IBS patient, you know, a female IBS patient and a, 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 and a woman who doesn't have IBS. So these mm -hmm. these differences in the processing systems in the brain, and that includes, you know, um, I mean, the basal ganglia, the the, the the salient system, even the optical system, it plays a big role in this multisensory integration. So it's a different way that I, I think that women construct the sensory experience from 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 the environment, from the internal mm -hmm. and external environment. I, I Do think you that's, think that? Um... Do you think that plays a role in, so when we have sort of a heightened activation of our stress response system because of trauma, and then we have that heightened sensory awareness or heightened external awareness of our environment, do you think that has some role in why women who have had trauma have such higher rates of IBS? Yeah, for sure. I mean that that's definitely some some factor. This uh, increased stress responsiveness. Um, so that's something that we're, we're currently trying to figure out. You know, our and our data to date, so both questionnaire data but also brain imaging data suggests that this increased um, stress perception. So it doesn't necessarily mean a greater stressor objective, but to, to perceiving this as a threat to the homeostasis of, of a woman's body and brain. Um, a small percentage of healthy people have that. Um, mm -hmm. A significant percentage of IBS patients have it. Um, and a significant percentage even of patients with inflammatory bowel disease have it because they also, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's it's not that just the inflammation their gut causes their symptoms. I mean, it's also processed at the at the brain level. And so this increased stress perception, which is almost certainly related to interoception as well, uh, definitely plays a role of 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 how people perceive or how women perceive um, their bodily symptoms, but also things around them. You know, and, and, and mm -hmm. yeah, it's a very um, you know, with 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 the whole women's movement, I mean, there was a was a time 
I still remember this. It, it sort of went into the other extreme, you know, like when I would say this like 20 years ago to some people at this of at, at, at the NH that um um you know there's this difference in in in, in the women's brain and in responding and and then you know some women got really up furiously and said okay so women can't be bus drivers and you have to stay at home and because mm -hmm. their, their yeah. brain is different so the backlash this, or the potential yeah. yeah I've talked with uh you know Lisa Moscone Dr yeah. Moscone yeah, she and I have talked about this and using that term, the XX brain, but the potential for that being misinterpreted and that, you know, it's really important to clarify that it's not, it doesn't change intelligence levels. It's just at actual different ways we perceive or maybe driven by different um, functions of our brain in different ways. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is kind of normalized again. I, I think we're yeah. now at, a, at the level where we can talk about scientific findings and yeah. uh, without sort of political opposition. Um, so let me. I mean, there's a lot of things in this gen in this general realm of questions that I'd love to to continue discussing with you. But I want to um, get into some some of the specific things that. Um, um you, you know that you have been pursuing and studying and promoting and are um deal with in your in your practice mm -hmm. um, so you you called your program women's functional and integrative medicine program <laughs> um i mean integrative medicine obviously both of these terms functional and integrative medicine has, has sort of become popular yes um why do you list both of them in in, in that title yeah, so it's a really great question. So um, I had an opportunity after I finished my medical training to work sort of in the eye of the storm of the functional medicine world. And I found that there were certain aspects of what functional medicine was trying to do and bring to the table around understanding root causes. Now, unfortunately, root causes is a term, it's a term that I've used for 30 years. You can go back in my early writing and find it, but it has become diluted so much in the wellness movement. When I refer to root causes, what I'm talking about is exactly what you, the terms you used, internal and external ecosystems and how those create a Venn diagram that creates our health. So sometimes that may be called more technically exposome mm -hmm. medicine. Mm -hmm. So from that perspective, I found that some of the architecture and language that I was learning in that model really resonated and gave some, gave some names to what I had been doing. But I've also found that functional medicine, unfortunately, like conventional medicine, leans too heavily on testing and Unfortunately, in functional medicine, unlike conventional medicine, I would say most of that testing is actually unvalidated mm. and unreliable, including a lot of the gut microbiome testing. And I would, I've found that I jokingly say, while conventional medicine uses a pill for every ill, functional medicine uses a supplement for every symptom. Mm. I included functional medicine in the title of that course because it is so popular that so many people are looking for training in it. And I wanted to make sure that the people who were looking for training in it found their way over to my program because it is the most comprehensive training in women's health. I mean, there's nobody else that is a midwife, an herbalist and an MD, and also has the perspective that I have on what may be gleaned from functional medicine that may be some golden nuggets, but also should be really more critically um, assessed. And so I teach both in the course. And integrative medicine to me, you know, Emran, if I would be able to call it anything, I would call it the new medicine for women. Mm -hmm. Or maybe I would call it the third path, which is integrative medicine, I believe conceptually looks at the whole person, right? That's what the idea is, integrative, it's whole it draws on a wealth of modalities. I also think that integrative medicine has become a little diluted in that it's kind of a smorgasbord. You know, you go to the integrative medicine fellowship 
in Arizona and you learn a tiny bit of everything, mm -hmm. but not necessarily enough of anything. Mm -hmm. So I bring these different worlds together and say, okay, here's what we can take from this. Here's what we can take from this. Here's what we need to be skeptical about and even critical about. And here's why I don't do this test and that test and the other test. And here's why when you get those gut microbiome results back, it doesn't mean that just because you have a preponderance of this, you're going to get those 15 diseases that are listed. In fact, this really doesn't necessarily tell us much of anything. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why I call it that. The reason that I created the program was in both the integrative and functional medicine worlds, I felt like there was a big gaping hole of how do we take all of this and apply it meaningfully to the spectrum of women's life experience in a way that you can have somebody who is an MD from Yale that you can really say has the chops to look at literature and evidence and say, look, that test really doesn't have any validity or meaning. And here's why I wouldn't use it. But also here's why we don't have studies on this, but why I would still use it. Because mm. in the absence of evidence doesn't mean lack of evidence. And maybe there's traditional evidence, or maybe there's not enough evidence for this yet, but enough people have tried it and are saying that it works for them and it's safe. But compared to that pharmaceutical, which, hey, maybe we don't have as much evidence as you think we have either, mm -hmm. or maybe that evidence isn't in women, or maybe we have evidence, but there's enough harm from that, that I wouldn't default to that. And I would try this first. So let's just look at something like anxiety as an example. I think that functional medicine might say, oh, that anxiety is definitely from someone's gut and we should give them these five different probiotics and those 18 different supplements and make sure we do all these gut tests. And I'm like, I don't think so. And maybe integrative medicines would say, oh, we should try acupuncture and massage and meditation. And I'm like, okay, those things are all good, but this is one person. They can only do so much. And function and conventional medicine would say, all right, let's start with a benzo. Let's start with the benzodiazepine, even though we know the data if you research it, the data shows that increases mortality is addictive and doesn't actually help with anxiety. What you really need if you're going to do something is cognitive behavioral therapy and an SSRI or an SNRI. Mm. So I'm saying, okay, we have small studies. We have a lot of research that makes really absolutely conclusive evidence that shows us that our gut influences our mood and may be a significant trigger for anxiety. And we have some small studies that show that women who ate a cup of yogurt a day actually had a reduction in anxiety or people who took this probiotic maybe had a reduction in anxiety. I'm thinking, why not try that first before we jump to the conventional? So that's how I think about it. And that's really the extent of what I teach in the program. No, this, this is this is great. I I mean I couldn't agree with it, you know, with it more. Um, I I find it amazing. I mean, obviously, you know, this this microbiome, gut brain microbiome science has exploded based on pretty remarkable findings in in mouse models, you know, some ten years ago, and then you have, and 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 these were all high quality studies. So you couldn't really criticize them on methodology. But then, you know, people jumped on this, the media jumped on it, and all of a sudden everybody said, oh, now, now we can treat, you know, the psychobiotic concept, and yeah. there's even a book out on it. And and then you look at the um, at the human studies, you know, they don't meet the same criteria, you know, right. in terms of quality. Um, and I certainly would not treat a, a person with an anxiety disorder with, with, a, with a psychobiotic. I, I think that uh, would be a good placebo effect, you know, that's... Um, um, and what people don't understand that this this lost in translation phenomenon, you know, to go from these animal studies to yeah. um, beyond correlational studies in humans that people that you know who have more anxiety um, eat less 
fermented food. You know, there are studies out there. Yeah. To jump then to the conclusion that this is a therapy, which so many people have done, you know, both the patients and influencers and, uh, you know, the functional medicine practitioners. Um, this is the big problem in this field, I think. You know, we're, we're not um, translating the mouse ex findings into human benefits and mechanistic studies has been very, very difficult and will still take. And I think a lot of the current practices will fall by the wayside. You know, it's not uh, a few of them will hold, I think. Um, but this is such a, a, a new and young field that I, I think, you know, many of this. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I, I think that service that you're providing, this information is is really extremely valuable. Thank you. Um, it's one of these... so exciting to me. It's so interesting. When I think about I remember um, back in medical school, I had a classmate who went on to become a very successful vascular surgeon. And he had um, ulcerative, he has ulcerative colitis. And he talked about how when he was young, he would just, you know, have to go to the bathroom violently to have a bowel movement. He couldn't always predict when that would happen. So he can remember being in the hallway in his class at school in seventh grade and a teacher came up to talk to him and all he could think of was where's the nearest bathroom in case I have to run. And when I was first learning about, for example, IBD, inflammatory bowel disease, and also we learn about in, uh, IBS the same way, it's the neurotic patient, right? These patients have so much anxiety and it's blamed on the patient. And even some of the bowel symptoms, oh, it's a neurotic patient, so they have these bowel symptoms. And now we know that these patients may have inflammatory disruption or microbiome disruption that may be part of what is contributing to that inner sense of anxiety. And so I can't ignore that, even though there's no data that says, oh, if you take this lactobacillus and this bifidobacterium, it's going to fix you. I still have to think, what can we do that is more than just what conventional medicine has to offer, which is usually mm -hmm. immunosuppressive drugs for the person with IBD or steroids or anti-anxiety um, anti, uh, medications that may be harmful, as I mentioned. What can we do? What can we do to help bring that microbiome back into alignment, reduce that inflammation. And even if the studies aren't there, what can we still try that isn't, and I think a lot of it comes down to very simple things. You know, what is our diet? How are we managing stress? How are we cultivating resilience? How are we healing some of the things that may be part of our trauma history or life history that may have affected our resilience because of, you know, high ACE scores or things like that. So I, that's what I try to mm -hmm. weave together in my practice. And I let my patients know, look, there's no proof that this particular diet or this particular thing is going to make the difference. But what is it that we can do to sort of start to pr bring back some order to those external and eco mm. internal ecosystems and then let the body Mm -hmm. which one of the things I've definitely seen is the body has this incredible capacity to heal and infinite wisdom. What can we do to nurture that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, let me just ask the simple Go question. Um, so talking about in, in, in this portion of the, of the interview, talking about the, um, the role of, um, of female hormones, female sex hormones, um, and their importance of many functions within the body, within the brain. Um, and one link that you highlighted in one of your posts, or uh, it's on your website, is about the role of the microbes, a uh, microbiome, a certain group of microbes <clears throat> that play a crucial role in metabolizing the estrogen that is secreted through the bile into the intestine. And it's not just lost, you know, um, lost with a with a with a bowel movement but it's actually a part of it is being reabsorbed and enters the circulation and that's variable it's variable depending on what microbes we have what phase of um yeah so you were explaining i mean how 
how um, these uh, these estrogen levels and the microbiome levels fluctuate through a lifetime, and yes. and how how the system is very fluid. I mean, it's not like something yes. that provides a fixed amount of estrogen that's being reabsorbed. It's a fluid yes. process. It's amazing. So this system that you're talking about is called the estrobilome. And you just take those words, estrogen and microbiome. We've got the estrobilome. And I mean, I feel like we've just barely scratched the surface of, of what this estrobilome even is. But to me, estrogen, and we think of estrogen as a female sex hormone. Well, both sexes have estrogen, men, women have estrogen. And it's influencing far more than just women's reproductive cycles. It plays a huge role in our reproductive cycles and it, whether when we enter puberty, if we're able to get pregnant, maintaining that pregnancy, and of course in perimenopause and menopause. But we also know there are many types, we have three different types of estrogen and we have different estrogen receptors and those are in our brain, our heart, our bones. So when I think of estrogen, people say, oh, you know, this estrogen dominance or estrogen deficiency. I think of estrogen kind of like Goldilocks. You can't have it too hot and you can't have it too cold. It has to be just right. And there's a variable range of what that is, but too little estrogen and we may experience cognitive challenges. We may experience bone loss, certainly as women will experience um, problems with our menstrual cycles and our fertility, but too much estrogen. And we may experience, particularly as women, problems like endometrial, endometrial and breast cancer. So I, again, I think we're just scratching the surface of the estrobilum, which is this, as I understand it, collection of gut organisms that have a genetic ability to modulate our estrogen levels. And it's not necessarily just this set of organisms or that set of organisms, because as we know, even what one set of gut bacteria or viruses do can change in the setting of a million different milieu, whether what we're eating or what we're stress levels or sleep, but also you can have a, an antibiotic that wipes out a whole strain of gut microbes, and then another set of gut microbes come and take its place. Mm -hmm. So that's part of why when people say gut testing and they're talking about pathogenic bacteria and beneficial bacteria, to me, it's so much more complex than that. And I think that we, so we know that this estrobilome exists. We know that we have this set of gut microbes that can modulate our estrogen levels, both making sure that we don't have excess estrogen levels and my understanding is, is that they can actually even act on some of the endocrine disruptors. They don't just differentiate. So some of them can actually help reduce the amount of our, our, our endocrine disruptor load by helping eliminate them. But they also help break down and make sure that we're also reabsorbing some of our estrogen so mm -hmm. that we don't have too low an estrogen level, which is really important. And especially when we get into perimenopause and menopause, when estrogen naturally goes down and our microbiome changes. So when I think about it, it's not like we can say, oh, if you take this probiotic group or strain or product, it's going to do anything for your estrobilome. We don't know that. So I tend to think of the estrobilome as part of maintaining overall gut health. Are we getting enough fiber? And I look at, and I, I look at some of the studies, uh, for example, um, that Boyd Eaton did and um, Melvin Connor on the paleo diet, which now like so many things like we talked about earlier has become, oh, you know, the paleo diet, it's this, this, and this, and this. It's very different than what what Boyd and Mel Connor yeah, yeah, found yeah. out. But what they looked at was how much fiber were our, our paleolithic ancestors getting? And I think it was estimated, they estimated about 100 grams of fiber yeah, a day. Yeah. And my understanding, even just for basic colon cancer prevention, we need about 30 grams of fiber a day. And the average American is getting about 15 grams of fiber a day. So I think, okay, if I wanna support a healthy estrobilome and healthy estrogen metabolism, making sure a woman is getting enough fiber in her diet, making sure that we're supporting healthy liver function, not with detoxes, but with actually supporting healthy metabolic detoxification by getting all the plant foods in our diet that we're meant to get, the quercetin, the polyphenols, all the things that help us break down estrogen and get it ready for that gut microbiome. 
are we getting healthy fats in our diet that feed a healthy uh, microbiome? Is the gut lining inflamed or healthy? So all the things, to me, that's what I do now based on the information that we have and my limited understanding of what we can do to support the healthy microbiome. Sleep, I think sleep is really interesting and the, um, the relationship between circadian rhythm mm. and healthy gut microbiome and vice versa, how a disrupted microbiome can affect circadian rhythm. Antibiotic overuse, is a woman getting overly prescribed antibiotics for recurrent urinary infections or other things that may be affecting her microbiome and therefore her estrobilome. So it's, it's fascinating. And so I do, you, <clears throat> do you see amongst your patients, so you mentioned it earlier, the, this topic of um, antibiotic, I would say abuse. And basically yeah. it's, it's, it's not really abuse. It's, it's, it's just a giving or taking antibiotics without the lack of um, indication for, you know, largely viral disorders or symptom based, uh, you know, complaints, um, which is so rampant. I mean, also there's this other example, like during, during delivery, you know, is, is, is this, I mean, what is your view on giving antibiotics to prevent the, the, the compli uh, complication uh, post-delivery of a staph infection? Yeah, we're, it's we're... very complicated. Um, you know, in Europe, in many countries, prophylactic or preventative antibiotics are not given at the beginning of every cesarean. They just don't do it. It's standard care here in the United States. So for every woman who gets, who has a cesarean, which on average is 34%, so one third of all women in the United States are going to give birth by cesarean and they're going to have antibiotics at the time of delivery. Um, that might affect her vaginal microbiome, probably not so quickly that it will affect in any way the baby, but it may cause her to have a yeast infection, which then she ends up taking more antibiotics for, and it causes thrush, and she has breastfeeding problems. And we see this. It's not done in Europe, and the data doesn't support better outcomes by giving it. So I'm not entirely sure why we still do here. We have a lot of what in our medical in our hospitals, you've, I'm sure, heard CYA medicine. For those of you who don't know what that is, it means cover your ass, and that is something <laughs> that is said in the hospital. Um, and then with group E strep, I think it's also really complicated. So 40% of women on average at any given time, if you sampled 100 women, 40 of us in a group would have the presence of group B strep, beta strep, streptococcus um, present as just a um, colonized organism, not causing any harm. But we do know that a small percentage of babies who are born vaginally, when there is the presence of laboratory detectable levels of GBS in the vaginal canal, those babies will pick it up and a smaller percentage of the babies will get sick. And of those babies, so maybe, you know, 1% of, of uh, or 2% of babies would get exposed and a small percent, 0.5% would get very sick. But of the babies that get very sick, there's a very high mortality rate. So we have this practice in US hospitals to give an antibiotic to a woman in labor if she meets a, a set of criteria, um, including having group B strep, being in labor a certain amount of time, um, rupture of membranes, a previous baby that got sick from group B strep, not just that got exposed but got sick we have these criteria and so a large number of women get antibiotics once or multiple times during labor and we know that is enough oftentimes to have an impact on the baby and the reduction in actual harm is about one percent now that's a very small amount unless it's your baby. If it's your baby, that 1% mm -hmm. could be life and death. And so I do think that um, it's, it's a personal choice. I have seen women who have done, made an effort to alter their vaginal microbiome during pregnancy, go from testing positive to testing negative, but that could also just be the chance of retesting. 
And also we know that once somebody's colonized, even if they test negative, they may test positive a week later. So we still give it even in that setting. You know, I have to say that when one weighs the risk of death uh, or serious illness of a newborn versus having some microbiome disruption, which I do think that breastfeeding over time, that baby's going to restore their microbiome. I don't think that most babies are going to have long-term asthma and allergies and obesity. Some will, but I think there are other factors that probably affect that. I think that it's a small overall harm to take the antibiotic in labor or to have it at the cesarean. I would like to see better studies done, better comparative studies done. Um, but right now I still err on the side of caution. Just go ahead and use it. But I do think that the benefit is, the risk reduction is very small amount of risk reduction. And I think that we may look at, we may look back in 10 years and say, you know what? There was more damage done from giving those antibiotics than we realized. Maybe there is more obesity. Maybe there is more recurrent infections, more otitis, more asthma, more eczema allergies, more atopic. But right now, I I'd still lean on the side of caution. I'm curious to hear what you think about it. Well, I mean, there's obviously all these other factors that you mentioned. I mean, clearly this early life development or programming of the microbiome is a fact, you know, extensively documented uh, by by animal studies. Um, and and that even a single dose in a mouse model of, of antibiotics to the pregnant mother would have an effect on the offspring. Um but I think there's so many other things, like like all the all the preemies, all the prematurely born babies that end up in the ICU, and get you know multiple doses of antibiotics. I mean, that's yeah. a, I think a real danger. The breastfeeding, well, and then they end up with necrotizing enterocolitis, which we have actually seen. That is one proven indication for probiotics, actually. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. So yeah, in my practice, what I do, and this is really more, I think. I think there's no harm in it and I think it's reassuring for pregnant uh, or new mothers is if the mother has received an antibiotic for cesarean or an antibiotic during labor, then if it's just cesarean, then I do encourage the mom to take just a general probiotic postpartum. And if the baby has been exposed either because the mom took antibiotics during labor for group B strep prevention or the baby needed antibiotics at birth. There are some small studies that, that suggest that taking a, pre, a probiotic in the third trimester or for the newborn after may reduce the risk of atopic conditions. And so I think it's harmless to do, and so I do that until mm -hmm. we have further data. Yeah, no, I mean, I think you're... What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think your your, your careful answer, I'm sure the listeners will really appreciate that because um, it's pretty one of the most careful statements and weighing of pluses and, you know, risks and benefits of that. I think what's, what's more, um, what's a lot more damaging is um, during the first, you know, few years, the antibiotic prescriptions for upper respiratory infections. Um, so, I mean, that's through the roof, hasn't really changed in, in the numbers. Uh, you know, not not breastfeeding. I mean, there's so many other things that, that are going on that based on your presentation of the risk, I think those other factors are, are, are much bigger, you know, so. I agree. I really encourage, you know, one of the big, impetus is for me to go from being a home birth midwife to getting my medical training wasn't just what I was seeing in obstetrics, but what I was seeing in pediatrics. And, you know, back even just 20 years ago, a mother could take her child to the pediatrician's office, even 10 years ago, and it's, it's still happening. As you say, the risk reduction, the reduction in overprescribing hasn't reduced that much. Um, but a mother could take her child to the pediatrician. You have a two-year-old who's whining and crying, their ear hurts, and the pediatrician looks and sees a little bit of a red eardrum and immediately prescribes an antibiotic. And the mother might say, are you sure my baby needs it? 
And the doctor would say, do you want your baby to go deaf? Do you want your baby to die? And mm -hmm. pediatricians were really saying things like this. Mm. And now we know that, I mean, in the United States, it's incredible. Something like by the time we're 20 years old, we've had 18 rounds of antibiotics, not doses, rounds yeah, prescribed it's, it's to us. Same, and it? then for women in our 20s to 30s, we get another 10 additional ones, usually for things like urinary tract infections or strep that strep throat you get in college or for obstetric reasons. And I agree. I mean, that early, that first couple of years of prescribing, mean, we're prescribing for one-sided otitis media when the data says usually take a wait and watch approach unless there's bilateral severe infection high fever the guidelines are all there and yet pediatricians are either too busy or are afraid not to and this has been studied we know the reasons pediatricians don't have the time to explain. That's going to be the one in a million cases that ends up as meningitis and they're going to get sued, aside from the emotional burden of carrying that. They don't know what to recommend instead, so they default to the antibiotics or the parents want to do something and they want to relieve suffering, so they prescribe the antibiotic. None of those are the reasons to prescribe an antibiotic. The reason to prescribe the antibiotic is it's indicated. So I always tell my parents who follow me on social media, you know, in settings like this, there's something called Get Smart, the Centers for Disease Control, which COVID has now made everyone aware of, the Centers for Disease Control, um, has an entire section dedicated to reducing unnecessary antibiotic use. And it's called oh, Get Smart. That's so I tell parents and I tell, yeah, you when you're in the office with your child and your pediatrician and the pediatrician is saying, recommend an antibiotic for this, I think you should do it. You can say to your pediatrician, can we look on the CDC, get smart and see if it's indicated or if we can wait and watch. If it's indicated, then I think it's possibly, probably appropriate. But if it's not, maybe take a different approach. And again, the guidelines are different in different countries. European, many European countries set the standard for the wait and watch with no worse outcomes than the giving the antibiotics, which has these downstream outcomes that we know of. Yeah, and the downstream outcomes are not, you know, people not dying from them. It's so these long-term consequences that we kind of have learned to in 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 Western medicine to accept as just like you know the the high cholesterol and the the the, the, the high blood pressure and the metabolic syndrome. We have we've we've kind of accept these things as part of normal of normal life normal it's kind of inevitable right it, it, it's inevitable yeah. and that's that's ingrained by the tv commercials you know they show these people taking antibiotic and their healthy parents or grandparents i i think it's a uh, like what i like to call this this chronic um non-transmissible disease epidemic you know with all these metabolic disorders and um we don't pay that much attention to it even though the cost is staggering in the billions um, people don't die anymore from it because they kept alive with all these medications. And um, so this is an- and I think a very unfortunate, a very unfortunate thing is starting to happen, which is, you know, you and I started talking about all the things in the 60s that were very ahead of their times that have really laid the foundation in almost a silent way for the things that we know now, whether it's Frances Moore LePay and her work on- um, food and environment or Mark, the late Mark LePay's work, he had a book on microbiome decades ago. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so we have all of this information. And we know when we look at, you know, these chronic non transmissible diseases, and we look at articles in like JAMA or New England Journal of Medicine, we know that what is it 80 85% of chronic conditions are not genetic. Mm -hmm. Lisa mm -hmm. Moscone talks about dementia we you know everyone thinks oh i have apoe4 yeah, yeah, dementia yeah. she says most of dementia is not genetic it's yeah, lifestyle yeah. and environmental yeah. so what's happened now is that i think many people started to catch on to this idea of wellness because they want to prevent these things that we know are preventable but now we have this entire wellness industrial complex mm. that is making exaggerated claims and selling people you know, 
I don't like to say snake oil because I do sometimes think maybe snake oil had high levels of essential fatty acids. So maybe there was something to it, but you know what we call snake oil. And so now it's giving wellness a bad name. And so now there's so much pushback on wellness mm -hmm. that almost I think is going to be a disservice to make people question things like eating well or taking care of our microbiome just because people are inflating the claims Mm -hmm. doesn't mean there isn't truth. And so that worries me that we're going to get such a big backlash against all the things that we know are, are important and healthy. It certainly takes people like yourself, you know, who, are, who have a legitimate training and background and that can really do this in a way. I mean, this is, you know, what I personally see in my mission as well um, in, uh, you know, teaching and courses and um, to really get this across that this, there's a there's a wellness movement that's really evidence based. You know, you don't have to follow all these. Um, and I like to use the term snake oils uh, as well, commonly because uh, it's it's horrendous what's being promoted. You know, and, uh, and 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 it doesn't really matter anymore if there's any science behind it, as long as the 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 you know the the promoter the messenger has two hundred thousand yeah. followers. That's enough. You, you don't need a oh scientific. Oh my gosh, I, I have to tell you, I don't know if I'm embarrassed to say or proud to say, but I just went on TikTok for the first time a couple of weeks ago. Oh, is like it? I actually went on TikTok and looked at it for the first time a couple of weeks ago. I have a friend. She has a very successful um, body products company, and she said, you should be on TikTok, Aviva. We need to hear the things you have to say. So she gave me a tutorial, and she showed me an example of a woman who has 2 million likes on her wow. on her TikTok, and she has half a million followers and she's a pharmacist and so my friend showed me two examples and one example was her saying that you have to take your probiotics at certain times of day for them to be effective oh my God. and i thought first of all we don't even know that most probiotics are effective for most anything mm -hmm. and second of all that's completely bs there's no evidence that says if you take this at this time of day and then the second one she showed me was that um, this woman is, this pharmacist is saying, and probiotics are all living organisms, so you have to keep your probiotics in the refrigerator. And I'm thinking, well, we don't know that that's true exactly 100% either. <laughs> we don't know if we have to have living organisms for them all to be effective. It may be some other okay. products. Of the... And so, but I thought, oh my gosh, she has so many followers because she just gets on there and has no impunity about what she's saying. Yeah, this is, this is really, <laughs> this is really sad. I mean, unfortunately it's happening in politics. It's happening in science and medicine. Um, I don't know what, what the outcome ultimately of this is in our world, you know, that everything is based yeah. on, um, on, on, on this influence of phenomenon and, and the number of followers that people have and no longer on, on on evidence so, yeah it's 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 it is a strange world um i think medicine to some extent has shot itself in a in the foot and kind of created this situation in that this idea that only experts have the information and when those experts are doctors who are alienating women by the way we're talked to because it is i mean if you look at the wellness movement most of the influencers are women most of the people who are buying these supplements are women even if they're buying them for their male partners it's still mm -hmm. mostly women other than in the maybe um, bodybuilding area it's still mostly women and so to some extent i think conventional medicine has to really have a reckoning of why it has driven so many people into this territory of lack of evidence. And I, I would love to see, you know, folks like yourself and myself be expert influencers that can provide that truth in the middle. Mm -hmm. I think that's what is so important. And I, I just think it just also highlights how many people are desperate for information and answers that aren't just another pill or another surgery or another, oh, it's, I don't know. There's it is amazing. Yeah, it is amazing. I mean, the need and, and um, people that have filled this vacuum is, um, and, you know, I often say to, to our students, I mean, this is something you guys should really um, get into, you know, and, and not, not create your personal Instagram channel and, and uh, you know, for women posing in a bikini or on vacation, um, but, but, but really take, 
the stuff that you learn in medical school and realize what what's missing out there you know like um and 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 sort of fill in this gap this is not really this has not really caught on i think medical institutions have not considered this a major um of major importance to to their trainees you know to do that um, so i mean we could you know we we could go on for a long time i mean it's 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 really uh, we should do this again yeah no we should do this again and as as i said i mean i i do hope we get this um this pbs special together and you know put put, put you as a, in a prominent position in there um oh thank you one question to to the end i was going to mention to you so you use terms like ecosystem you know you have this ecological interest mm -hmm. and um which i would say also goes back to the 60s um and you know i would also throw in systems biology to understanding of how all these complex systems are actually and then this this paradigm of interconnectedness that that, that everything essentially is interconnected so when you talk about your hormones, you know it's it's obviously a crucial system that I personally, in my in my own conceptualization, so I've I've created this system, the the brain gut microbiome system, and with bidirectional connections and um, influences on all parts of the body, um, being influenced by the external environment. And and I have to admit I've not taken the hormonal system seriously enough in 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 that conceptual framework but oh. but but it is i mean it, it's it's just another system it's so there are the metabolites you know the hundreds of thousands of metabolites there are you know hundreds of hormones and metabolites um there's these molecules that uh, the, that the microbes produce i mean ultimately you know it it does translate into the systems systems view of our bodies and 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 in our world and um so i mean how how do you look as i i think i know the answer now from talking to you but how how do you see this uh from from your perspective so hormones clearly a very important factor um maybe more important for the female body and the female brain for than for the male brain but um yeah how do you put the hormonal system this complex system together with these other systems that I mentioned that also influence our bodies. Yeah. So one of the things that I find most important about understanding this interconnectedness and also these multiple systems influences, including the external ones, including ones that happened before we had a say so, maybe those 10 antibiotics that we had between the time we were two and 14. Um, for me, particularly as a women's physician and also a physician for children, so I'm taking care of women for themselves and women as mothers, I think the first thing we tend to do when we have something going on in our bodies with our health is we ask ourselves what we're doing wrong or what's wrong with us. So to me, the first thing about the system's perspective is that it reminds women that there are a lot of complex factors happening in the world. And it's not just what you eat or don't eat. It's not just if you're having positive or negative thoughts, like some of the things that we see in the more simplistic mm -hmm. aspects of the wellness movement, that there are so many factors. And all we can do is sort of look at these factors and see where we can improve some of these external systems or internal. Can we reduce our stress? Maybe that will help. Can we improve our sleep? et cetera, et cetera, all the things that we do to restore health within the context of, um, within the context of the system's biology, I guess I see the hormones as this musical, um, kind of backdrop to our lives and particularly as women, but for men too, I think women, we have more obvious cycles daily and weekly and monthly and throughout the course of our life, but men experience some cycles too, um, whether those are circadian or testosterone rhythms. Mm. I think of our hormones as music. And I know for me, when I'm listening to music that uplifts me or that inspires me or that keeps me focused, it's very different than listening to music that is disruptive. 
And all of these other influences to me are what change the station. So if the, if the hormones are the music and my, my, my moods, my sleep, my sex drive, my focus, my joy, all of it, my alertness, my sleepiness, my inflammation, all of my bone health, my brain health, if those are influenced by the music, I want to look at the things that are changing the station, causing static interruption, making the volume too loud, making the volume too quiet and see what I can do about those. And I think that we're just, for me, I'm too much of a novice in my understanding of the minutia of the microbiome to know how much the hormones themselves are influencing the microbiome. How much does estrogen change the microbiome? I know there are studies that show it does. How much does estrogen change inflammation? Tremendously. How can that affect the microbiome or the gut lining, which may affect mm -hmm. the microbiome? So I look at all of these pieces of it. And you use the term bidirectional. I'm sure that there's an enormous bidirectional influence of what's happening with estrogen or progesterone, for example, on the gut microbiome. Just the way we know there's a huge bidirectional influence on cortisol and mm -hmm. the microbiome. So I just look at it at, and say, okay, we know in the big picture, there's definitely a connection here. We know that there are lots more studies to be done to show the actual lattice work of that connection. But the bigger thing we know is kind of coming back to sort of the something like maybe Michael Pollan might, might, might write about, which mm -hmm. is, you know, eat good food, not too much of it. Yeah. If your grandmother can't pronounce it, what's on the label, maybe, it, you know, these kind of sort of yeah, yeah, yeah. Simple life wisdoms is what is is what we do know that make a difference. So, getting seven or eight hours of sleep, getting enough fiber, um, trying to, you know, get all the plant based. I I eat some fish and meat in my diet, but a primarily plant based diet, legumes, all these things. That's how I think about it. Well, that's a wonderful way to close our conversation for today. I hope we'll have uh, follow-up opportunities to continue this. And uh, thank you so much, Aviva. Really appreciate it. Oh, my gosh. It. Total pleasure. I hope we have many more conversations online and offline. Okay, absolutely. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye.